A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. We are recording this on Wednesday, November 10th of 2021. Our guest today is criminal defense attorney Josh Ritter, who's also a former prosecutor. Josh, it's always lovely to have you. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. And Josh, you've got your own podcast here at True Crime Daily. Yes, it's been very exciting. Excellent. Okay. Well, we've got some cases for you. Um, Here's what we're looking at. A good Samaritan, along with an assist from social media, saves a 16-year-old girl who was using hand gestures to signal to other drivers that she was in distress and that she needed help. A driver in Kentucky spotted the signals and then she called 911. This Good Samaritan was so unbelievable. The Good Samaritan even followed the car. Um, So the information could be relayed in real time to the 911 operator. So the girl was rescued and she'd been missing out of North Carolina and the man that she was with was arrested. But first, a veterinary technician is found brutally stabbed to death in her South Carolina house. A classically trained concert pianist with no known relation to her turns himself in And then he gets charged with her murder. So here's the other thing, that there are two other men in her life who have been arrested on completely unrelated charges, at least we believe so. Is there a connection? It's really unclear. And, um, you know, I don't believe in much coincidence. So, Josh, I'm... You, by the look on your face, I'm guessing you think it's pretty suspicious. It, it, it is weird. And I, I agree with you. It's hard to to say that this is all a coincidence, but we know so little at this point that, it, I, you know, I, I, I want to follow the story to see how they piece it all together. But you're, you're right. How could how could so many kind of incredible things happen at once? Yes, exactly. It'd be like one massive black cloud over right. this this woman, you know, who has truly been, you know, a true victim here, murdered, and then those around her, or at least the men around her. On Wednesday, October 13th, 41-year-old Christina Parcell is found dead in her house in Greer, South Carolina, which is a suburb of Greenville. It was about 11 a.m., and an acquaintance, we do not know this person's identity, calls police. Investigators from the Greenville County Sheriff's Office say that Christina Parcell was brutally stabbed. Deputies then went door to door in the community asking, you know, do you have surveillance cameras? Do you have a ring video doorbell? Can we figure out if you may have inadvertently caught something on one of your cameras between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. on that day, October 13th? So this is what's so odd, Josh, that while investigators are chasing these leads down, um, last week on Wednesday, November 3rd, this 29-year-old man who is a professional concert pianist travels the world playing, very well regarded, very well educated, walks into the sheriff's station, accompanied by his attorney, and he turns himself in. His name is Zachary Hughes. He has no known prior criminal history that we've been able to figure out. And his relationship to the victim, Christina Parcell, is unclear, unknown, or the sheriff's department isn't saying. Right. It, I mean, it's very odd for someone just to break into someone's house and yeah. stab yeah. them well, if they don't well, know them. Well, and especially the way that the the police are describing it as a brutal stabbing. I mean, that, you know, for them to use those kind of hyperbolic adjectives and everything, it, it must have been a really horrific crime scene. And then like, you know, something out of a movie to walk your client in for surrender to a station. I mean, this kind of stuff just does not happen. I've I've had clients who are, you know, persons of interest and people that the the investigators are looking at. And there's a lot of discussion that goes back and forth. And, you know, if you guys are going to issue a warrant, please let us know first. But to take this kind of proactive action, I, I haven't read anything about a warrant being issued. But so for them to take the proactive action of walking him in ahead of time, they must feel that somehow that's in his best interest, which leads me to believe that this case is is going to concretely tie him to what took place in some kind of way. Apparently, according to published reports, he was identified at least as a person of interest by the police. 
in the days prior to him walking in. So I would then presume there had to have been a conversation at some point where they called him or questioned him because, you know, unless he has some, you know, divine abilities to be able to, to know that he's a person of interest. So, uh, I, I, something went down there. Right. And, and there has to be a reason why authorities zeroed in on him allegedly. And then there has got to be a reason why he turned himself in. Right. Right. And like I said, it, it must have been that somehow his attorneys felt there was some sort of advantage to him taking that proactive step to say, here I am, I'm going to take responsibility. They must have felt would somehow work in his favor. I don't know. So the following day, after he turns himself in, the sheriff holds a news conference. Obviously, this is a big, you know, news item. It's also a huge crime in the area. And so Greenville County Sheriff Hobart Lewis said that the crime scene was indeed brutal and violent, that the victim was definitely targeted, that this was not an accident, and he would not say what kind of physical evidence might implicate the suspect or if they found the murder weapon or weapons. So why take to the news cameras to say this? I I don't know, but one thing they're for sure saying is premeditation, right? They're, they're letting us know they know this was a crime that was planned out. It wasn't he randomly knocked on some person's door. It wasn't a moment of uh, insanity that led him to this. But they believe they have evidence that he planned this and she was definitely the target, which is premeditation, uh, which is per- possibly lying in wait. Um, it, it, this this story is pretty fascinating. And sheriff also, the sheriff also said that detectives had clearly identified Zachary Hughes as a person of interest. So he confirmed that at the news conference. Now, here's what else that the sheriff has said since then. He says there are certainly going to be other charges coming. So what does that mean? And that there could be other people involved again. What does that mean? Yeah, it you know, you kind of understand where law enforcement has to play some of this close to the vest, right? They, they ongoing investigation. There's only so much information they want to share with the public until this gets into a courtroom. But they seem to have been teasing us a lot here. They're 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 kind of winking and nodding at a lot of you know things might be on the horizon, especially not confirming or denying if anyone else was involved, especially in light of what you said about other members Uh, or people close to the victim being arrested themselves for unrelated charges. Yeah, but I do believe that when a law enforcement says publicly that there are other people involved and that other people will likely be charged, that's a warning shot, a very public warning shot. I know who you are and I'm coming after you. And I think it's a way of, of putting public pressure on these people, if they indeed exist. We don't know. It could just be a tactic. It could be a, a fishing expedition. Yeah. Yeah, it could be pressure to have them turn themselves in like uh, this gentleman did. Very unusual. Yeah. So um, the other thing that the sheriff said, he said, if you're talking about the actual murder, it's Mr. Hughes who is our guy. So the sheriff doesn't seem to have any question that he has the alleged killer in custody. And then he said, quote, it was more than obvious that he intended to kill her and he went over there to kill her. The other thing that's missing here is motivation. Why? How did they know each other? What happened that he was in such a state to go over there? Yeah. And allegedly kill her. You know, one of the first things you think about in these cases where there doesn't appear to be any kind of connection between the perpetrator and the victim is that perhaps this person was hired, right? Perhaps they, for whatever reason, got involved in this. And because they don't have a connection to the victim, they were the one who was hired to to commit this murder. Now, as we're going to find out about this young man, he does not seem like the type of character who would get caught up in that type of a scheme. So I... I could be just making a complete shot in the dark here about that murder for hire idea. But when we find out who he was and the background that he has, he is not your typical uh, kind of contact for that type of situation. 
Yeah, the guy's a concert pianist who graduated from Juilliard. I mean, generally, I mean, that (laughs) you tend to have um, a more gentler, more sensitive individual when you have musicians. That does not mean that musicians cannot be violent. I am not suggesting that, and I, I am not trying to paint a really broad brush. But it, it does tend to be a more sensitive individual, so it's just really odd. Yeah, and the and the dedication to that art, to that to that to being that high of a level of a, a musician, you know, it, it that's not a that's not a fringe characteristic, right? That's not a person living kind of on the on the borderline between, you know, law and crime. That's a person who's dedicated their lives to to something like this art and you can't imagine why they would get swept up in something like this so hughes does not live in that neighborhood zachary hughes does not live in that neighborhood however he rents an apartment in downtown greenville so it's not like he was just randomly in the area so it's possible that they could know each other right Zachary Hughes is being held without bond in the Greenville County Detention Center on charges of murder and possession of a weapon during a violent crime. Okay, so explain that to me. Does that mean that there's been a search of his residence or car or anything like that? I mean, are you going to tell me that if he is the killer, that he would have brought the murder weapon with him to the sheriff's station? Yeah, well, I... It could just be an allegation that they're adding on to the murder is that that this was a murder committed while he was committing another crime. I don't know if they're going to say that that other crime was burglary of her home. Maybe there was some sort of forced entry of her home ahead of time. Uh, I don't know. Nope. A lot of us do not know on this one. So according to the Greenville newspaper, Christina Parcell was a mom. She lives, she leaves behind a young daughter. She worked as a veterinary um, tech at a vet hospital. And she also worked at a dog rescue shelter. Okay. So again, here we have another individual, you know, doing good in the community, right. serving animals, and taking care of them in shelters and rescues. Right. And another okay. individual who's not living what you would call a high risk lifestyle, right? Right. I mean, right. And then a concert pianist, right? Yeah. Whose hands, hands are the most valuable thing that he has. Yeah. So if you're going to use a weapon or you're going to do something really physical that could potentially harm your hands, um, I, I have a friend and neighbor who is in the LA S- Symphony. And she plays the cello. She walks around with these giant gloves, even wow. when she's just in a walk in the neighborhood, yeah. because she cannot risk doing any damage to her hands if she should fall or anything. Wow. And that, that's how seriously musicians protect the instruments on their body that they use for their art. Yeah, and you, you make me think of uh, of Another very interesting point is the choice of weapon here, right? I mean, this it, it, had he shown up with a gun and we're talking about, you know, one gunshot to the head or something, but a knife murder is a very intimate, for lack of a better word, way to kill someone. And the way that they've described the crime scene, it you know, somebody doesn't necessarily die from one stab wound. You have to sit there and and not to get too graphic about this, but repeatedly plunge a knife into someone to kill them again this doesn't seem to square with the type of personality it sounds like he was uh to choose that type of a weapon to be a murder weapon a lot of this just doesn't make sense no so christina worked at the foothills veterinary clinic for about three years in Greenville. Now, of course, I'd always say, you know, how is it that people run into each other? They run into each other at the supermarket. I have no idea if Zachary Hughes has any animals, but maybe ran into her at the veterinary hospital or at the rescue. Of course, this could be completely off and there could be something, you know, totally different as to how they met. But I'm just putting putting it out there. Now, according to Zachary's own website, he was born in California, spent half his childhood in California before moving to rural Virginia, and he was homeschooled. 
His favorite composer is Ludwig van Beethoven. Really not so odd, considering he's a concert pianist. Uh, he's a graduate of the prestigious Juilliard School, and he has played concerts in Europe and in Japan. He played in Knoxville with the symphony, and he had been scheduled to play with the Greenville Symphony, which would explain why he would be renting an apartment locally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, now let's talk about the two men in Christina's life who have been arrested and why this is all so bizarre. Okay, so Christina's husband, and, and we believe him to be her husband based on some research done by a local television station who says that they found a marriage license. So that, that's how this is being based, and so we want to be very careful here. Sure. So he has been arrested for child porn, and then the other man in her life, who would be the father of her daughter, has been arrested on a child custody violation. Yeah. And they were arrested one day after the other. Yeah, yeah. And again, we don't know if these are connected at all. At all, but oftentimes a tactic of law enforcement is if they believe that other people are involved and they have a reason to pick them up to hold them in custody while they are trying to piece together why they might be connected to the the, the real crime that they're investigating, they'll oftentimes do this. Um, uh, it, I mean, we saw this in with with Brian Laundry, right? The FBI was investigating him in regards to credit card fraud because that was a way that they could actually bring him into custody had had it not been that he turned up dead, but it was a way that they could have held him and investigated him while they were trying to piece together why he might have been connected to to a murder. And so I, I wonder if that's the same tactic being employed here. I really don't know. <laughs> I, it's, it's definitely curious. It yeah. is definitely curious. So let's start with the father of her child, who is her ex-partner, because apparently they were not married. According to WYFF-TV, the two had been involved in a bitter custody dispute, and each had filed a protective order against the other. And this had been going on for years. Yeah. Okay, so that's one situation. So, and his name is John Mello. He was arrested on October 20th and charged with violating a child custody order. It's unclear which child, so I don't know whether we can assume that it's her child with him. I don't really know. But according to the warrant, he allegedly took a child under the age of 16 out of the country for more than 72 hours, preventing court-ordered visitation. The warrant says that John Mello was believed to be in Italy at the time, He's being held in the Greenville County Detention Center under a $5,000 bond. This is the same detention center that the accused killer of his daughter's mother is being held. Oh, but interesting. Wait, there's room for one more. <laughs> WYFFTV reports that the Greenville County public records show that a man named Bradley Eugene Post applied for a marriage license this year with Christina Parcell. This is the man who we're referring to as her husband, but a lot of things are unclear here, right. whether they actually they have a license. Right. So the day before the baby daddy gets arrested on the violation having to do with child custody and visitation, this guy... Bradley Eugene Post gets picked up for allegedly possessing child pornography. Bradley Post is 65 years old, much older than Christina. Yeah, yeah. And he's arrested by sheriff's deputies and charged with one count of third degree sexual exploitation of a minor and five counts of first degree sexual exploitation of a minor. He is being held without bond at this now getting very crowded detention center. Yeah, right. Okay, so now you have the father of Christina's child is being held. Her believed to be husband is being held. And the concert pianist is being held, all of them, for different reasons, in the same jail. Yeah, uh, and again, this is a total shot in the dark. Um, 
but I've seen this before in law enforcement is that oftentimes they will arrest folks uh, that might be connected and might have a reason to talk to each other and hold them uh, in adjoining cells. And they might be recording what's going on, hoping for a conversation, hoping for this connection between the two of them to cause something to come out in their conversation and they don't realize that they're being recorded. Again, I, I have no idea. We're going off of such little information, but if we're just putting together that kind of suspicious, not suspicious, but that kind of coincidental behavior of them all being held in the same detention center, I would not be shocked if we started getting audio tapes later on. And the sheriff says he cannot confirm whether there is a relationship between Zachary Hughes, the accused killer, and either of these two men in Christina's life, and if somehow they're all connected to her murder. Yeah, and you would, think not it, say. you would think if they were not connected, for sure, that they would go ahead and say that. But the fact that they won't make a comment makes you believe maybe there's something there. Our next case is really important because it shows the power of social media and how we really must be alert yeah. to our surroundings. So, Josh, I'm going to let you take the lead here. Yeah, I, I think you're really going to enjoy this one. I did. So it's about a good Samaritan and social media. A driver on a highway in Kentucky sees a passenger signaling to them, and he recognizes the hand gesture indicating the stress and calling 911. And allegedly, uh, uh, an abducted 16-year-old is rescued and a 61-year-old North Carolina man is uh, is arrested. So this takes place in London, Kentucky, about 150 miles southeast of Louisville, Kentucky, and about 150 miles south of Cincinnati. And according to the Laurel County Sheriff's Office in London, Kentucky, someone is driving on this Kentucky highway called 911 around noon. This was just last Tuesday, the, the 4th. And the caller said that the female passenger appeared distressed, and this is the, the real kicker part of this story, and was making a hand gesture. He said that the caller uh, said that they recognized the hand gesture from the social media platform TikTok. Are you, are you on TikTok, Anna? You know, I've tried to go on TikTok. It's like the one <laughs> social media platform that for some reason is just, I don't know. OK, I, <laughs> I, I'm going to make a confession that I am way too old to be on TikTok, but I have been on TikTok mm -hmm. um, mainly because when COVID shut down everything, everybody was looking for some way to distract themselves on their phone. And it's the perfect outlet to do that because it's just video after video. But apparently it can also uh, be educational and in this case, perhaps even life saving. But the gesture, uh, the hand gesture in question is with the palm up and out as if waving high and then the thumb is tucked into the palm and the fingers come over the thumb and palm and repeat and this is known as the signal for help so uh in doing some research for this i checked out TikTok and looked up what is the signal for help and it's true there's a lot of videos out there explaining to folks that if you're ever in a situation where you can't say help me or you know, overtly grab someone and say, I'm in trouble, that if you're able to covertly kind of give this signal, it's a way of letting folks know uh, that you're in trouble. And, it, and, and I asked my wife, I said, you ever heard of this signal for help? And she goes, oh yeah, you mean the TikTok thing with your hand? And so <laughs> I guess word is getting around. Um, anyhow, an organization called the Canadian Women's Foundation launched the quote unquote signal for help campaign as a way for people in distress to signal on a video call or in this case in person. Originally launched uh, the social isolation measures when it was originally launched, they described it as the social isolation measures necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic are making it more difficult for those who are at risk of abuse or violence to safely reach out for help. And I thought that was so interesting how COVID has isolated us and how mm -hmm. the kind of normal interactions that we might have don't exist anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there were people weren't responding anymore. You couldn't necessarily go to shelters. Everything completely right. shut down. So I think it's fascinating that this Canadian organization, yeah. you, you know, that helps to save and support uh, women in, in trouble was able to come up with a hand gesture where if you were on a Zoom call, 
or you were on FaceTime with a friend or a family member, you could kind of surreptitiously do this without your abuser in the background knowing what was going on. It's interesting. It's very specific in time to the pandemic and very specific for people who have no other way of expressing their distress in a safe manner that isn't going to get their abuser back on them. Yeah. Um, I remember, too, there was a great concern when we were in the kind of most strictest part of the lockdowns when kids were being kept home is there was a concern about uh, child abuse in the home and how would children be able to report this if they're not going to school or a safe environment to report what's taking place in their home. And so I imagine this was one of those um, kind of ways they had of hopefully addressing this. The the other thing I was thinking of, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, the concept of angel shots. Have you heard of that before? No, I haven't. I, this is something I've seen again on the internet. I've not witnessed it myself, but apparently in some bars, they will have a sign in the women's restroom that if they feel that they are in a situation they're not comfortable with or or the person that they're with is being hostile to them, that if they go to the bartender and order an angel shot, that that's a sign, a signal to the bartender that they need help. And that that either means calling authorities or getting people involved or helping them to get a ride home. So it's these creative ways of helping folks in these really dire situations. And the amazing thing with this 16-year-old who was reported missing by her parents two days earlier is, you know, she she'd been all over the place with this guy, right? He'd been driving her through many states in those two days. Yeah. So it's amazing um, that she was, we don't know for how long she was asking for help until this one driver who knew exactly what yeah. this girl knew was that, doing right knew what that signal meant yeah the 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 caller described the silver toyota car and said that a man was driving and the female was in distress and he continued to follow the car to your your point um down interstate 75 and gave updates to 911 apparently he po- followed them for several miles and even as the car exited the highway sheriff's deputies were able to make the arrest and and up uh, and you know kudos and an applause to this driver for sticking with it because like you said who knows how long had she been signaling and who knows uh how many other people would just feel like i don't want to get involved maybe they they knew what was happening and don't want to get involved in any case the uh the female in the car is a 16 year old girl who had been reported missing as you had stated uh, uh, two days earlier her parents reported her missing from Asheville, north carolina she told deputies that she had been driven by the suspect through North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and into Ohio, and apparently where the suspect had relatives. And relatives of this suspect reported that he found out that the girl was traveling with had been reported missing, and then that's when he started to drive through Ohio and into Kentucky, and where she began signaling other drivers for help. Uh, the suspect is now been identified as 61 year old James Herbert Brick, who was arrested um, and deputies examined his phone. And this is where things really start to get disturbing. And he was apparently uh, alleged to have had um, images on his phone, which portrayed a juvenile female in a sexual manner. So it really begins. We begin to understand the nightmare that may have already been happening and could have had could have continued had some good Samaritan not gotten involved. There is just no good reason for a 16 year old girl to be in a car with a 61 year old man who she is not related to. There's just no reason, no good reason. Yeah. And again, thank God this person took it off on themselves to, to get involved. Uh, James Herbert Brick, uh, Brick, pardon me, has been booked on charges of first degree unlawful imprisonment and possession of uh, matter, which they're describing as sex performance uh, by a minor. He's being held at the Laurel County Correction Center on $10,000 cash bail. And uh, he appeared in court and where kidnapping charges were then added, which is not surprising because if he's transporting this minor across several state lines, it would be surprising that kidnapping charges would be added. And we have learned, this is according to um, WKYT, 
that Brick was found with an inappropriate picture of the girl in question, which police say he actually tried to delete from his phone. Um, so Brick's booking info lists him as a resident of Cherokee, North Carolina. The Lexington Herald Leader newspaper reports that they were previously acquainted, so this wasn't some sort of random kidnapping, but that the girl initially first traveled with him and then became scared is when she started contacting folks. So again, one of those stories that gives you nightmares if you've got children, or even if you don't, of the horrible things that could happen, but thank God for good folks who still feel uh, the courage to get involved. Yeah, it's really frightening because you know, you have to wonder over the course of those two days, they had to have stopped for gas. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like he was driving the whole time through several states. So if they stopped for gas, was she able to ask for help? Right. Did she, was she too afraid to? Did she, or was it one of these things where you think you're in over your head, but you're really not sure. And right. you're like, I don't think he's going to hurt me, but I don't, it's yeah. hard to know what was in, in, in her head at that time and, and what he said to her. I mean, he could have been right. threatening her. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and for the folks that got involved, you think of how many times, you know, human people's human nature is they see something, they may think, oh, I don't know if that's right or not, but I'm going to mind my own business and kind of continue down the road and get to where I was going. But thank God for somebody who said, you know what? I'm going to do something about this. I don't I don't care if I'm wrong or right. I'm getting the police involved and let them figure it out. Yeah, it's better to just let the police either explain to you that there isn't anything or they couldn't find anything and don't ever feel bad about it. Yeah, absolutely. It is time for our comments section and our producer Owen Michael is here. He is in charge of all of our social media, is always reading what you all are saying. And these are the cases that you all find really interesting. Hi, Owen. Hello, Anna. Hello, Josh. How are you guys Hi, doing? Uh, yes, we do get a lot of comments and we read all of them. Let me tell you about a California story we've got this week. So a 31-year-old self-proclaimed fortune teller was arrested in California for grand theft and theft by false pretenses after a woman allegedly paid him more than $50,000. So-called fortune teller told her that she had parasites and that she and her children, in fact, her entire family were cursed. Same man has previously been busted for fraud in Chicago, taking money as a faith healer. So allegedly this uh, person is kind of a serial exploiter. Charles K says, wait, she had $50,000 and was cursed. Hmm. <laughs> my thought there. Uh, Rennell S said, sorry, but if you're dumb enough to give somebody $50,000 for that, then you deserve it. Rennell has no sympathy. Uh, Rizio I said, I guess it worked because the cops busted the parasite, LOL. <laughs> and uh, Monica P says what we're all thinking. He should have seen that coming. <laughs> yes, he should have. If he were a truly good fortune teller, he would have seen the cops coming. Indeed. Psychically, of course. Uh, innocent until proven guilty, but uh, uh, fifty thousand dollars. Why? Wow, that's a uh, that's a steep steep fee. That's not uh, you know doing the twenty dollar palm no. reading at the, uh, uh, on your on your local that's, street corner. That's pushing your luck a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So. People are desperate for answers sometimes. Good point. Yeah. Thanks, Owen. Good seeing you. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys. See you next Bye -bye. week. Bye. That's our episode for this week. Josh, thanks so much for joining us. Where can people find you on social media? Uh, yeah, so you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Joshua Ritter ESQ. And uh, like you mentioned, uh, please check out the latest episode of True Crime Daily's The Sidebar. Uh, this week we interviewed um, attorney Mark Garagos. It's a pretty great interview and I hope people check it out. Excellent. Great. It's always a pleasure having you on. You Thank can you. find me at Anna G News on all social media sites. You, of course, can find episodes of all of our podcasts, including Josh's and My Favorite Case. We have a bunch of them out there. Wherever you get your podcasts, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel and sign up for our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com because Owen puts that together. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.